scarlet stains upon the body, and especially upon the face of the victims, were the pest ban which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men. In the whole seizure, progress, and termination of the disease were the incidents of half an hour. But Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When thousands hail and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court, and with these retired to the deep seclusions of one of his castellated abbeys. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric yet august taste. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion, and while the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade, but first let me tell of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven, but in the western or black chamber, the effect of the firelight that streamed upon the dark hangings through the blood-tinted panes was ghastly in the extreme, and produced so wild a look upon the countenances of those who entered, that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. It was in the, uh, this apartment also that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony. The pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang, and when the minute hand made the circuit of the face and the hour was to be striking, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical but of so peculiar of a note and emphasis that at each lapse of an hour the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance to be hearkened to sound, and thus the watchers perforce ceased their evolutions and there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company. And while the chimes of the clock yet rang, it was observed that the giddiest turned pale, and more age and sedate passed their hands over their brows as if in confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled as if at their own nervousness. But in spite of these things, it was a gay and magnificent revel. And now again the music swells, and the dreams live, and writhe to and fro more merrily than ever. Taking hue from the many tinted windows through which streamed the rays of the tripods, but to the chamber which lies most westwardly of the seven, there are now none of the maskers who venture, for the night is waning away, and there flows a ruder light through the blood-colored panes, and the blackness of the sapple drapery appels. And to them whose foot falls upon the sample carpets, there comes from the near clock of ebony a muffled peal more solemnly emphatic than any which reaches their ears who indulge in the more remote gaieties of, of the other apartment. And thus too it happened, perhaps that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sank into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. And the rumor of this new presence, having spread itself whispering around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz, or murmur, expressive of disprobation and surprise, then finally of terror, of horror, and of disgust. The figure was tall and gaunt, and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat and yet all this might have been endured if not approved by the mad revellers around but the murmur had gone so far as to assume the type of the red death when the eyes of prince prospero fell upon this spectral image he was seen to be convulsed in the first moment with a strong shudder either of terror or distaste but in the next his brow reddened with rage he exclaimed who dares who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery seize him and unmask him 
then we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of this group in the direction of the intruder, who at the moment was also near at hand, and now, with deliberate and stately step, made closer approach to the speaker. But from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the murmur had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth a hand to seize him, so that, unimpeded, he passed within a yard of the prince's person. Assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the room to the walls. He made his way uninterrupted, but with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first. It was then, however, that Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. He had approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the retreating figure, when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleamingly. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revealers in the blood, the dude halls of the reveal, and died in each in despairing posture of his fall. Darkness and decay and the Red Death held illimitable dominion over all.